I am live. Good morning, everybody. I am alive, alive in Jesus Christ. Amen? We welcome everyone, whether you're joining us remotely or here, we are in full swing of glorifying the King Jesus. Amen? Amen. The one that set us free, the one that truly has redeemed us, that paid a ransom for me. Amazing Grace was one of the songs we sang here at the end, and I know it is truly beyond amazing as we gather here once again under the banner of love. Like I said, we bring greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. If you are joining us remotely, we welcome you. Put a little heart throb or whatever on uh, your screen. Let us know that you're, that you're there. We do, uh, we do want you to know that we are anticipating the time that you and everyone else, we can all gather together again as a, a family here. And I thank God that he has kept each and every one of us safe and whole and healthy. Amen? God gets the glory. God gets the glory. Well, this morning, we'll put up our screen there. The title of our message is called God Uses ordinary and kind of as a prologue of the the message here today's message is encouragement to each and every one of us I'm preaching this to myself as much as I bring it out here to you it's an encouragement of the value that you have as a redeemed Christian in Jesus Christ. It's real examples of real people that were really quite ordinary. And it's a message to realize what the Lord looks at when he sees you. And it's a message on how we can appreciate even more deeply one another in the giftings that we all bring to the table here together in our daily lives and as we assemble together. I've got a quote this morning that I'd like to start off with before we get into the message, before we open the Word. It's a quote by Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott has been dead for probably 70-some years here, but he was an interesting person that was a missionary down in Ecuador and uh, felt the calling to go to a deep part of the jungles down in there, ended up becoming a martyr. But he had a heart for God, and he is famous for this quote. Listen to it. I'm going to read it slowly because it really pertains to the message today. He says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Now there's a little bit of slowness there that I had to at least for myself. So I'm going to say it again because it's very valid. It's relevant for this morning, this day. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Salvation. You cannot lose that if you are truly, again, in the hands of the Father and have that relationship where your life is surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I like that quote here because as we open up the word here, I want you to open to 
the first letter of Corinthians where Paul is going to speak to us in that first chapter. And let me read for you, beginning in verse 26. So if you've got your Bibles open, apps open, everybody good? Everybody awake? I see eyeballs, good, 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 good. Paul says this, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God amen this is a remarkable message when God calls people verse 26 Consider your calling, brethren. You say, well, I, you know, I, I, I just, you know, come to church. I, I don't have a calling. <laughs> Paul says, consider your calling, brothers and sisters. He's speaking to every one of us, not just a few. So when God calls, he tends not to call the wise, the influential He tends not to call those of noble birth. No, but rather in his great wisdom, God chooses to use the foolish, the weak, the lowly, the despised. Why does God do that? So that no man may boast before him. You see, God does not need one bit of our natural wisdom, our noble birth, or our influential positions to accomplish his work. If it were otherwise, then such persons might be tempted to boast that their own abilities were at least part of the source of a successful ministry. But when God mightily uses what the world arrogantly calls foolish, weak or lowly or despised people, then God alone, God alone will receive the glory as he always must. Amen? So this message is very relevant. It is very good to understand what we as Christians have as we Fulfill our calling. And we'll get into that here. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, You will be my witnesses. You say, oh, I mean, I'll hold on now. I, I didn't sign up for that. Okay? I, you know, I believe. I'm good. I come to church on Sunday mornings. And, you know, that other stuff, I'm not too good at that. Okay? That's not my cup of tea, okay? I I can't talk. Didn't Moses even say that? To God. He said, oh, come on, don't pick me. He said, I can't talk. Hell, Aaron, you know, he's a good talker. God says, you shall be my witnesses. An example of a witness is someone who sees and experiences an event, then testifies to it in court in a way that convinces others. And that's what we've been called to do. You see, we've been saved. We've been forgiven. We've been sanctified. We've been baptized. And I've seen and experienced it. Now, I'm fully qualified. I'm fully able to be a qualified witness. 
to anyone to share and speak words of kindness and authority, pointing them to the power of a redeemed life. Amen? You say, but I personally, I'm just talking for myself. I don't feel qualified. Can I say this? God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Amen? (laughs) He qualifies the called. And don't let Satan convince you otherwise. Speak to you in any other way because he will try. He will tell you God has an IQ requirement or an entry fee uh, that he employs only specialists, experts, and high-powered personalities. (laughs) No, really, he doesn't. God uses ordinary. Can we go to the next screen, please? Paul wrote about our witness this way. Open up 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Give you a chance to get there. Very important verse for us to understand. For us to write onto the tables of our heart. Because Paul talks about our witness in this way. He says, you are our epistle, a letter written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tablets of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. You see, Jesus said to his disciples, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. You, uneducated and simple folk, you, temperamental net-casting fishermen and tax collectors, you will be my witnesses. The one thing that the disciples had going for them was their willingness to take a step when Jesus said, follow me. So if you're more plumber than executive, if you're more painter than a professional, if you're more blue jeans than blue blood, you're qualified because God qualifies the called. Let's turn to Acts chapter 4. Beginning there in verse 13, here's what ordinary people do when they get an understanding of the power of their witness. Acts 4.13 says, Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been (laughs) with Jesus. Now, do you see? Do you see what it really, really takes to be able to be a good witness, to be able to truly represent Jesus well, what was it? They said, we recognize that you've been with him. Our time, our mornings, our nights, our whatever time that we set aside are very, very critical. Yeah? It's our relationship. It's that building. It's what has to happen if we truly want to understand more of him. It's the desire of our heart. It's that desire to be in that dwelling place, to be in that shelter, to be under that hedged umbrella. It's what we want 
It's our life. It's, it's all. Our all in all. Peter and John had just been used by God in an astounding miracle, the healing of a man crippled from birth. Read about it in Acts 3, first eight verses there. They were dragged before the, the Jewish leaders for interrogation, and Peter answered when they brought him before their courts and said, by, by who? What authority? How is it that you speak? Jesus answered, Peter answered and said, it was by the name of Jesus Christ that the man had been healed. Read in that Acts chapter 4. Can I say this? The Jewish priests, the scribes, and the elders suffered from elitism, believing that only a limited number of people in high positions could be used by the Lord. That elitism continues in the thinking of many religious people to the present day. But God confounded that prejudice. He chose to use those who the snobbish might consider just ordinary, everyday people, such as Peter and John, to do great things for him. To me, this gives us, it gives me hope that we are going to see many, many more signs and wonders and miracles and things happening right in our midst. Why? Because he will choose to use the lowly, the ones that are humbly seeking his face, and God promises that he will move. And I believe that, I hold to that. It is secure, amen? Have you ever felt that God couldn't use you to serve him because you were just too ordinary? He, Jesus Christ, is the one that gives meaning to your life. From Genesis to Revelation, the Lord used ordinary people to meet needs and to be used as his instruments to bring deliverance and to bring provision or to bring leadership. That was certainly true of David. We are certainly aware of the time when a giant Philistine was taunting the armies of Israel. Everyone, including King Saul, was paralyzed with fear. So whom did God select? He chose a shepherd boy who had been sent by his father to take food to his brothers to the front lines. He went out to face the giant with what? A few stones, a sling, and more importantly, faith in God. That was the person God used. A shepherd boy. Someone who was the youngest, who certainly was not the biggest, but had proved himself in the field. Who knew who his father was, who knew that when an enemy came to attack him or his sheep that he had charge over, what did he do? Back off? Get afraid? Run? <laughs> Read about it. He slew the bear. He slew the lion. He took the lamb out of that enemy's mouth and saved it. What a parallel our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, saving us from the hand of the enemy. Amen? At another time in Israel's history when they were immobilized by fear because of their enemies, following seven years of cruel oppression by the Midianites, Israel cried out 
to the Lord God for relief. Who did God find? Gideon. Where was he at? Threshing wheat. Kind of off hidden away because he was trying to do it secretly enough so that the Midianites wouldn't steal their food. Gideon was convinced that God had called the wrong person. Do you remember the story? The angel comes to him while he's threshing wheat on the floor. And the angel comes to Gideon and says, Ho, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. (laughs) Gideon had to have looked around and said, "Uh (laughs) Uh-oh, there's somebody else with me here because that ain't me. He said, I'm the least in my father's house. I'm the youngest. My father isn't even a bigwig. I mean, (laughs) you got the wrong family here. And I don't even know who you are. But God called Gideon. God called, why? Because Gideon had a heart to obey. God selected Gideon because he didn't trust in his own ability. Gideon was conscious of his own weakness and the difficult task before him. Read about it. He laid out several times fleece before the angel saying, okay, you've got to prove this. You've got to show me. You've got to do this. I don't know that you've got this right here. So I'm going to lay out a fleece. If you do this, and he did it several times, God's mercy was with him and showed him, yeah, I am going to use you. Therefore, he was an ideal example of how God works deliverance through ordinary people. Gideon trusted in God, and he used Gideon to deliver Israel. Let's talk about another person, Isaac. Isaac in the Bible is there to show us how God can use an ordinary person. Isaac was the son, he was the ordinary son of a famous father, right? And the ordinary father of a famous son. Although he lived longer than Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph, Isaac's life is pretty much covered in one chapter whose most exciting uh, feature is some squabbles over some wells all the times that they were digging up the wells and they'd cover them up there. That was Isaac. You might say that Isaac was the Calvin Coolidge of his day. I don't know if any of you know what Calvin Coolidge was even famous for, but he was a president, and they called him Silent Cal. They called him Silent Cal because he wasn't noted for much other than being quiet and sleeping 11 hours a day. Just a little bit of trivia for you there, okay? And when someone reported that Calvin Coolidge had died, they replied, how do you know? How can you tell? Yeah, Coolidge was silent Cal, but yet he led the nation during the Roaring Twenties with a very positive pro-business ethic. So he was somebody that was used for his ordinary abilities. Isaac might have been kind of a blah person. Uh, He wasn't bold like his father Abraham, who had made a daring raid against the kings of the east. He wasn't shrewd like his son Jacob, or a gifted leader like his grandson Joseph. Yet God used him to work out his covenant promises. His life shows us that there's hope in the Lord for all of us ordinary people. Amen? Let me say this too. Christ has promised that he will build his church. In spite of any of our slowness, in spite of any of our shortcomings, in spite of 
any of our attitudes. God will bless and use us to fulfill his purpose in this day and time because our relationship to the Father through the Son is real. But we need to grow in faith and obedience. So the emphasis of this exhortation today is on God's working out his purpose through ordinary people who obey him. Today, we need to see ourselves in the stream of what God is doing in history. Yeah, right now, what we are doing right here in your life, in your secret prayer, prayer time, God is using those prayers. Does it not say that he bottles up and saves the tears? Amazing. Think about it. He's using that even today here. He's blessed us not just so that we'll be blessed, but so that we can become a blessing to others. We can't bottle this up. He wants us, ordinary though we are, to be his channel for taking the message of the Savior to all nations. That sounds glorious, but all too often, you and I know that it involves hassles, as mundane as digging wells and contending with aggressive people. God didn't give the land to Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob in one real you know, swift magic swoop of his divine wand. Those to whom Moses was writing had to go through the battles of taking Canaan bit by bit, area by area, day by day is how we make it. And through the power of the Holy Ghost, we are well able. We are well able to go into our day, to go into our land, to go in and take and conquer and overcome what God has told us to take. Amen? Let's go to the next screen, please. You know, I remember... I remember growing up in Sunday school. And I found to me at that time that it was more frustrating than inspiring, just being honest. Each week's lessons kind of gushed with biblical heroes, champions of God, each more grand than the others. It, wasn't, it wasn't as though I didn't believe those accounts. I did. It was just their heroic deeds didn't compute in my underachieving world. Can I say that? I mean, I, I listened to those stories. And I thought, <laughs> that ain't me. Okay? What's that got to do with me? I squirmed when I heard about David dropping Goliath. <laughs> or Daniel surviving the lion's den. Come on, really? They seem more fictional than real, more make-believe than true. Elijah at Mount Carmel and Moses at the Red Sea, it intimidated my barren resume. Come on. <laughs> These guys are just like way above anything I could ever imagine. And then you heard of Noah and the ark and Gideon and his 300 and Ezekiel and those bones. <laughs> and Solomon's visit by the royal queen of the south, Jonah's big fish. Come on, Joshua's demolition, demolition derby, Jericho, okay? Samson's strength, Paul's insights, Peter's charisma, Stephen's boldness. Amazing. But they were ordinary people, I found out. That they were just people like you and I that had the same kinds of 
things that they had to deal with. Let's take a look at the Apostle Peter. Good example of what I'm just saying. Okay? Peter. Jesus told Peter that he would deny him three times. Read about Matthew 26. Peter's response? No. No way. I will not deny you. Again, read it. Matthew 26. Here's the thing. Peter did deny Jesus three times. And Jesus saw it. Imagine that you are the Apostle Peter, a leader of the apostles and a member of the inner circle of the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and you just denied him three times. You would feel devastated, shamed, and guilt-ridden. In fact, that was what happened. Peter went out when he saw the eyes of Jesus Christ fixed on him as he looked and the rooster crowed three times after he had just denied Jesus. And he went out and it says he wept bitterly. It broke him. But in a good way. It turns out what was meant for bad and uses it, used it to testify to his grace. God says because of the finished work of Christ, you, you and I are victorious. The, the apostle Peter went on to be mightily used of God because he was broken, died to himself, and surrendered all that he had to God. Just for proof of that, read in Acts chapter 5. It talks about Peter's shadow healing all those who were laid in the streets. Do you think Peter had a change? Do you think Peter finally understood that God was qualifying the called? Look at Acts chapter 22. Another man. You only hear his name once, Ananias. This Ananias was the one that God spoke to him in a dream and said, I want you to pray for a man named Saul who later became Paul. This Ananias, the only thing that's written about him is that he was a devout Jew. The only thing. Yet he laid hands on the eyes of Saul so that his sight was recovered so that Saul could become Paul and go on to write two-thirds of the New Testament. And then, and then you had the, the little-known heroes of the, of the faith. They were like, most valuable players in sheep clothing, such as some of these names I can't even pronounce, did, no more did I know them, all right? Shifra and Pua. They were two midwives who dared to defy Pharaoh because they answered to a higher power. They put Moses into the bulrushes there. Bezalel. He was a simple architect to whom God gave the job of a lifetime. He gave the, the plan for the building of the temple. Ehud, used by God for no better reason than he was left-handed and available. Shamgar, though mentioned only once in Scripture, he still had time to kill 600 Philistines and to save Israel. Asa, a son of godless parents who became a godly king. You see, there's hope for every one of us 
no matter how young you are, how old you are, what color you are, God is going to use ordinary people like you and me. Amen? All of these were comparative, comparatively ordinary people whom the world might call nobodies, but they were the nobodies of whom the world was not worthy. Truth is, I've discovered that God uses ordinary people far more often than not. For example, none of Jesus' 12 disciples brought credentials into their roles. Most came from modest backgrounds, little distinction, kind of an eclectic collection with run-of-the-mill talents. None of his 12 had a theological degree. Not one fit the mold of a rising religious star. Yet, they became the chosen vehicles to carry Jesus' timeless message, right? For Jesus to leave his entire ministry, think about this, in the hands of 12 ordinary men was a gutsy move. What if they failed? What if they forgot? There was no plan B, but he took the risk. Why? He saw the heart, this heart that was willing. 21 centuries later, he's doing it again. He's leaving his work in our hands. What are our credentials? Are we superheroes? Are we megastars? Hardly. Just men and women who routinely find ourselves on our knees acknowledging our complete inadequacy and utter dependency. Sounds overwhelming? Sometimes. But it's not. Because it's not about us. Can I say this? It's about him. Luke chapter 10. Verse 21 says, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Let's go to the next screen there, please. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12. I love that first couple of verses. Because it really speaks to my heart. And it reads like this. Therefore, I urge you, brethren by the mercies of God to present your ordinary, that's my emphasis there. I urge you, I exhort you, I plead with you, brothers and sisters, that you take your ordinary bodies and make a, a, a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your, my word, ordinary spiritual service of worship. That's your ordinary, that's your reasonable service, as the word says. And it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I cannot tell you how many times as a very young Christian in my last year of high school, and it was very popular to, at that time, the Spirit of God was moving in the mid-70s. There was a very strong, charismatic move, even in the Catholic churches, and I remember many times praying, saying, Lord, what is your will? How do I know that I'm in your will? 
show me your will. Lord, how do I accomplish your will? And there was always this question that never seemed to ever get an answered. You know what I mean? It was always just like, what am I supposed to be doing? I mean, what is Christianity all about? And then you get understanding. And then you get filled with the Holy Ghost. Speaking in other tongues. <laughs> and you get the understanding of that verse. Where Paul says, I beg of you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That results in what? You know. You understand. You get to feel and get comfortable that I understand what the will of God is for my life. It's to serve Him. It's to be holy. It's to be consecrated. It's to be alive in Jesus Christ by presenting my ordinary body as His to use however he wants. The point made is that without an equal emphasis on discipleship in normal life where our energy is less than infinite, the gospel can become imbalanced and undeveloped. If we don't have the focus on Jesus Christ in your everyday life, it can become totally out of whack. So, the answer to how do I do this is found in the life and in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We spent the last few weeks talking much about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, haven't we? We've talked about why is it important to know and understand that Jesus Christ truly did rise from the dead and that he lives. In his death, Jesus is our atonement, bringing us back into communion with God. In his resurrection, Christ is rebirthing, he's sanctifying and making everything holy and new. In short, the radical has already happened in Christ. Because of him, all of this life is now exceptional, beyond amazing. There is no sacred or secular distinction. There is no ordinary with the extraordinary being out of limits. All of life as we know it now, can be alive and infused with His Spirit. So if you're hungering for more of God and desire to be used by Him, then use whatever gifts and talents and abilities you have and direct them in the right, point them in the right direction towards God. Become motivated by a desire for his glory by using your God-given gifts and talents in the church and beyond to edify God's people and expand the kingdom of God. Didn't we say at the beginning, you shall be my witnesses. Then you will join the multitude of ordinary saints before you who before you who become Extraordinary because they served a God who is glorified, not by self-serving people, but people who are humbled by His grace and holy before Him. 
if we're constantly making our own spiritual progress, advancing in Christ-likeness, being a Christian, growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, as it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, we will find that his blessing will overtake us. Go to the next screen there, please. Whatever ministry, whatever gifts that you have, entrust them to God and use them in His power. Be, become alive in His Spirit for His glory. Watch as God grows you in His grace and uses you in many extraordinary ways in the lives of his people. Hebrews chapter 11. 11. Says, through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Sarah, just a somebody, but she exercised faith to the point where she received the promises of God. Go to that next screen there, please. If you read through all of Hebrews 11, you'll find many, many examples Many, many examples of men and women that were used of God. We gave one example of Sarah, but it also talks about by faith Abraham, and by faith Noah, and by faith Isaac, by faith Jacob, and by faith Joseph, and by faith Moses. And by faith, the harlot Rahab. And time would tell, fail me to tell, reading from verse 32, of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, of David also and Samuel, and of the prophets who through faith, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in, in uh, fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and, their, and others were tortured, accepting not, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. God's word is true. The examples that he gave to you and I so were so that we could understand that he will use a vessel for his honor if we only submit. I'm going to end with a verse out of Acts chapter 2. In this sermon that was given after the day of Pentecost, beginning in verses 16 through 18, it was made to understand truly what we're all about. It reads like this. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Verse 18, even on my servants, both men and women, 
I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I say, let's fulfill this. Because these words were spoken for us in this time, this day, and this hour. It is so that we could become a blessing to others. It was so that we could be equipped with the power of the Holy Ghost and be able to do as it was commanded and so that we could fulfill even that great commission that was spoken in the last chapter of Mark saying, and to them that believe. Are you a believer? These signs shall follow them. And it goes on to tell. They shall raise the dead. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall lay hands on the sick. God's word is true. That's for you and I. We've got to believe that. Yes, we are ordinary people. But God has truly qualified us by us simply accepting his calling. He's saved us. He's redeemed us. He's given us life. He's ransomed, paid for us so that we could be redeemed to a holy life. Amen? Amen. God truly does use the ordinary. The screenshot that I have up behind me, I just couldn't resist because truly if you're going to be my witnesses sharing is great sharing with one another become that living epistle become that written epistle on your heart so that everywhere you go whether you are shopping whether you're getting gas wherever it is you're willing to pour out you're ready to pour out. Sharing is great. Amen? So as we wrap up here this morning for our live stream service, could we just stand together and raise our hands toward our Heavenly Father and give Him all the glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus you can play a little bit of soft music there if you'd like. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are our provision. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are our way maker. Lord, that you are our healer. That whatever we need right now, Lord, I pray, be fulfilled through the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ healing wherever it is wherever you're at put your hand wherever it hurts and right now in the name of Jesus Christ we pray pain infirmity sickness be gone be killed because we apply the blood of Jesus Christ over all of this knowing and declaring and proclaiming Jesus Christ is alive thank you Lord for hearing our prayers thank you Lord for doing above and beyond all that we ask or think way beyond more come into this Lord Jesus Christ as we again dedicate our lives to serving you as ordinary people prepared to do extraordinary things in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior and everybody can say Amen <laughs>